among the goals of the progressive left in this country is to destroy every institution that undergirds the American Republic. One of their targets, their chief targets, is the founding of this country and anything related to it, including the founders themselves. One of their favorites, one of their favorite targets, is the Electoral College, which in their view is somehow related to slavery. It's all about slavery. It's all about racism. Just Google Electoral College racism, Electoral College slavery, and you'll get all kinds of hits. This is pure BS. That's not why we have an Electoral College. What I want to do in this video is explain why we do have an Electoral College. The first thing to understand is, at the time, in 1787, when they're drafting the Constitution of the United States, there is no place on the planet where people are directing, directly electing their leadership. You know, most of the countries, states around the world are ruled by kings, queens, emperors, kaisers, czars, sultans, shahs, whatever. Not elected officials. Now, the closest you get to an elected senior official would be in Great Britain, with the prime minister. But the prime minister wasn't directly elected by anyone, except his own constituents, and constituents who sent him to the parliament, and where in the House of Commons, if he could put together a majority faction, he would become, with the king's blessing, prime minister. That's how it worked. There's no place on the planet where they're directly electing a chief executive. It's just not in the cards. There's no place that American, the American founders would be looking to find a system that works in that fashion. The second thing you have to understand is what had gone on before that with the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation had a government that had very little power. It wasn't even really a government. It was a confederation, it was sort of like the European Union. The individual colonies, states, were considered separate, independent nations. It, the United States at that period was considered a plural term. These were states that were united. In fact, they were actually united in a confederation, not a central unified government. Under that system, there was a president, but the president was elected by the unicameral legislature the Congress, which meant a president would always be beholden to the Congress because if they didn't like what he did or if he vetoed a bill, they could get rid of him. They just, you know, elect somebody else. What they were trying to do was to put more centralized power into the new government, the new governmental structure. But because there was more power, as a safeguard, they wanted to separate it whereas the Confederation, all power was in the unicameral Congress. The new system of government would have much more power and true national power, but the power would be divided by a separate executive, a bicameral legislature, Senate and House, and a separate judiciary. Judges had been also elected by the Congress before. So they're trying to separate these things. So the question then becomes, where do you get an executive? Where do you get a president, a presider, to preside over this entire thing if you can't get him out of the Congress? The answer they came up with was to get him from the states. That's one of the reasons they end up with an electoral college. They're looking for the states to do the electing of the chief executive, of this president. Now, the idea was the states would have electors. The electors would be linked to the number of people they sent to both the House and the Senate. So in other words, whatever your, senator, your congressional representation was, plus two. And you would get that many votes for the election of a new chief executive. You also have to keep in mind that in 1787, there's no internet. There are no computers. There are no smartphones. There's no Wi-Fi. There aren't even landlines. There's no telegraph. There's no television. 
There's no radio. There's no national newspaper. There's no USA Today. There's no Washington Post. There's no New York Times. The papers that exist are commercial papers that talk about trade and prices in different ports, or a handful of partisan papers that are just hack sheets, lies, filled with lies and distortions and everything else. There's no national sense of communication. It's very hard to move from the wilds of uh, the District of Maine, which belonged to Massachusetts at the time, and Southern Georgia. You know, you go by boat, or you go by horse. There are no trains either. You keep all this in mind. So one of the problems they have is where are we going to, how are we going to find leaders? Who, what leaders will there be who will have a national presence, a national, uh, people have a sense of them at the national level? Now, you have a couple of those people in this period. George Washington's the obvious example. That's why he becomes the first president of the United States. You have Adams. People know who Adams is, and people know who Jefferson is. But after that, you know, people in Maine don't know all these other people. So, and they're trying to get a system for the future, a future in which they don't see the telegraph, mass media, radio, television, the internet. So their belief was, and it didn't turn out this way, but they believed that most elections would be settled in the House of Representatives. Basically, you'd have 13 states, and either each state would nominate somebody for the presidency, or maybe a group of states, maybe Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and, and New York would get together and nominate one person. And maybe the southern states, the Carolinas would nominate a person and Georgia would nominate a person, and New England would nominate a person, and that these people would then get ballots cast for them, and probably most states would vote for their own people or their own regional candidate, and nobody would ever get a majority of the electoral vote as it was set up. They expected that's what would happen. Now, that's not what happened in most elections. Actually, that became the exception rather than the rule, but that's not what they foresaw. And then these electors would come in and there'd be a deadlock. Nobody would have a majority. I mean, you know, whatever the number now is, 270, it was much smaller then. And then the House would vote. And the House voted the way the House had voted or the Congress had voted under the Articles of Confederation. Each state got one vote. So the states would vote and then they would pick the president. That's how this was expected to happen. None of that has anything to do with slavery. What it has to do is the context, political context of the time, the political lessons they had learned from the revolution and the, the Articles of Confederation, the lack of any means of communications you know, throughout the entire country. So that's what this was set up to do. Of course, the other element in here that is there has to do with the small states. It's important to keep in mind that under the articles, each state, no matter its size, you could take the most powerful state at the time was Virginia. You know, one of the smallest states was like Delaware and Rhode Island, the very small states. I forget which one was smaller. Under the articles, each of those states, every state only had one vote, and each state had a veto power. Basically, if all 13 didn't agree, bills didn't get passed. Now, that's one of the problems with the Articles of Confederation. What they're doing, following the ideas laid out in the Declaration of Independence, the idea of a social contract, that people voluntarily enter into and give power to a government to protect their rights, yielding some of their rights in order to get protection for the rest. That's what we call a social contract. That's laid out right in the Declaration of Independence. So what you have to do if you're putting together this new national union is to get the individual states to agree to give up their existing rights, which include equal vote, one vote per state, and a veto power. Those are significant holdings for a very small state like Rhode Island or Delaware versus big states like Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. 
And what they want to do is to get all 13 states to buy into this new federal union. The minimum is nine. And they figure if they can get nine, the other ones will come along eventually. But ideally, they would get all 13 to ratify this deal. So why would a small state, and we'll just use Rhode Island as an example, because ultimately some of the people who, who cut these deals come from Rhode Island. Why would Rhode Island give up equal legislative you know, coverage in the House? You know, under the articles, Rhode Island and Virginia are equal. They both have one vote. And Rhode Island and Virginia both have a veto. They can veto anything. Why would a, a small state like Rhode Island give up that equality, give up its veto power to join a federal union? And these are why they had to sweeten the deal for the small states. And there's, there's basically two ways they do that. One way is the Electoral College. Because in the Electoral College, even a small state, like today, Delaware has one congressional district and they get two senators. So they get three electoral votes. California you know, has two senators, even though they, you know, they have several 10 times the number of a population. I forget exactly what the population of California is compared to Delaware, but it's infinitely larger. And they have, I don't know how many house seats, close to 40 or around 40. Delaware has one. But Delaware gets a disproportionate vote in the Electoral College, as does Rhode Island and Wyoming and Montana and the Dakotas and the other small states. That's part of the deal for these states to get them to come into the union voluntarily through a process of a social contract. The other part of the deal, of course, related to that is the U.S. Senate. Every state gets equal vote, two. Delaware, Rhode Island, they each get two. California, Texas, Florida, each get two. That's like it was in the, under the Articles of Confederation, where each state had one vote. You had equality of voting. So basically what they're trying to do, this isn't about slavery, this isn't about race. This is about getting the small states to join the union. Because the small states are giving up equality of representation in the House. They'll still have it in the Senate. And they're giving up their veto power. And in return, they get equality in the Senate and an overcompensation for their size in the Electoral College. That those are the sweeteners of a deal to get the small states in. Because the small states at the time don't come in. You know, they, they want it nine out of 13, it means they can't lose more than four states. And uh, Delaware is a small state, New Jersey is a small state, Rhode Island is a small state, uh, Georgia is a small state, and the Carolinas aren't that big either. I mean, other than Virginia, it's, it's a, a Virginia and Maryland are the two big southern states. If they lose, you know, five of the small states, there's no constitution. There's no United States as we know it. Now, it's quite true today in our current environment, chief executives are elected in national elections around the world. That's changed. We do have national communication networks today. That's changed. You can run a national campaign. Now, on the basis of that, you could say, okay, then we really don't need an electoral college anymore. But the other elements of the electoral college I should say the other element, primary element, has to do with the social contract. Contract. You know, you cut a deal. You sign on the bottom line for your car loan. You have to pay it back or you're going to lose the car. It's a social contract. But the small states in this union signed on. The small states in this union that we live in gave up their veto power, gave up equal representation in Congress. You could call it affirmative action for small states. That's not a bad way to look at it. They were trying to make it a sweetener to equal the imbalance between the small and the big states. That's still an issue. And if you want to go back on that, you're basically going back on the entire contractual basis 
of the federal constitution. Now, there are, of course, ways to change it. We do have an amendment process, but it's going to be awfully hard to do. You need 30, 38 states to do that out of 50. And I'm sure some of the small states, Delaware, New Jersey, Rhode Island, are so blue, they would vote to give up anything if they thought it would uh, enhance their party's power. But a lot of the small states aren't going to want to do that. A lot of the big states aren't going to want to do it. It's going to be very difficult, well nigh impossible, I would say, to amend the federal constitution under the processes that are outlined in the constitution to get rid of the Electoral College. One other thing to keep in mind with the Electoral College is, I know it annoys people when certain things happen, you know, Donald Trump becomes president, even though Hillary Clinton had a majority of the votes. Al Gore had more votes than George Bush. But, you know, it's not always that way. If you had a runoff, you know, if you had a presidential election with multiple candidates, and in that, until somebody got, like if you have in Georgia right now with these Senate races, until somebody gets 50%, you have to have a runoff with the top two candidates. Bill Clinton didn't get over 50% in either of his elections. You had uh, third-party candidates running. You would have runoffs. And I would argue that in 1992, if there had been a direct runoff between George Bush and Bill Clinton without Ross Perot in, on the ticket, it's, it's not unlikely that George Bush would have been elected. So there are times when uh, the Electoral College helps Democrats. Woodrow Wilson would not have become president in 1912 had it not been for the Electoral College. So you can scratch Woodrow Wilson, forget him too. And of course, the most obvious example is Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln won pretty significant electoral majority in the election of 1860. He only pulled 40% of the vote. 60% of the people in the country voted against Abraham Lincoln, and yet he became president. So do away with the Electoral College. You might be doing away, if you could go back and do away with Electoral College, you know, slavery would have existed probably for several more decades. We'll never know for sure. But that's not that unlikely. But I think the main thing to keep in mind is, you know, where they come up with this idea that this is related to slavery. You know, it strengthened the Southern states. The Southern states had slavery, blah, 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 blah. It's not designed to strengthen the Southern states. You know, keep in mind, the strongest state among the initial 13 was Virginia. Virginia was the California of its day, and it was a slave state. It was the big slave state. It was the small states they were trying to protect with the Senate and the Electoral College. The Rhode Islands, the New Jerseys, the Delawares. Later on, when Vermont came in, another very small state. These are the states that benefited from the Electoral College. These are the states that benefited from the Senate. Later on, it's true, the Senate is used by the South to try to balance the power of the, the non-slave states as you approach the era of the Civil War. But that's not, they didn't design this, you know, looking ahead to a Civil War. They designed this within the context of a time. Where else do you find executives directly elected in 1787? The answer is nowhere on the planet. Got something out of this video? Give it a thumbs up. Hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. Share it with your friends. Subscribe to the channel if you can. And until the next time, keep fighting.